Welcome and good morning. Um, we are here today to talk about transition planning for students with chronic mental health challenges. Um, just a couple of um, housekeeping items um, in terms of uh, using the chat versus the Q&A. Um, we will be happy to take plenty of questions at the end of the presentation. Um, it, and so if there are um, specific questions um, that you wanna ask, you can type those into the Q&A anytime during the presentation, but we'll take those at the end. If you happen to um, hear a term or have questions, uh, you know, sort of not understand something that we are specifically discussing on a slide, uh, please do let us know that uh, either through the chat or, or the Q&A. Um, and we'll try to monitor and make sure that we make any clarifications we need to while we're going. Uh, but most questions will be saved for the end of the presentation. Um, so good morning, I'm Kelly Challen. I'm the Director of Transition Services at NESCA, um, and I oversee consultation, planning, assessment, and coaching services here. Um, just to give you a sense of my background, I personally started my career working with students with disabilities in 2004. Um, I worked at some of the most well-known summer camp programs in Massachusetts at that time, um, including a camp that evolved to be what's now Milestones Therapeutic Day School. And I spent some of my early career at MGH Aspire, um, developing some of their teen and young adult programming. I also worked at the Spotlight Program at the Northeast Arc, which was an improv-based social skills program for students with a range of social cognitive differences. Um, and we had some uh, different contracts, uh, actually with Department of Mental Health there um, to be doing some social skills work and uh, transition work there. Um, and I joined NESCA in 2013, um, which feels like a very long time ago now, um, midway through my 10th year at NESCA as Director of Transition Services. And so in this role, I perform transition evaluations, consult to families, offer college planning, and work directly with teens and young adults on their own career and transition planning process. And I also oversee our team of transition experts. And um, one of these wonderful experts is Dr. Lindsay Wood, who's an occupational therapist and transition specialist here at NASCA. And that's who I'm gonna be presenting with today. Um, so Dr. Wood focuses on evaluating and helping students and young adults with a wide range of abilities. Um, she does have special expertise working with students with autism as well as students contending with mental health issues. And so I'm really excited to have her be here with me for this presentation. Um, Dr. Wood graduated from the MGH Institute of Health Professionals, the IHP, with a doctorate in occupational therapy. And she holds state certification as an occupational therapist in Massachusetts, as well as Vermont, and is working on New York as well. And she's nationally certified through the National Board for Certification in Occupational Therapy. And she's worked at hospital-based, school-based, community-based programs, including Mount Auburn Hospital, the League School, and Boston Center for Independent Living prior to coming to NASCA. Um, Dr. Wood currently works as part of NESCA's transition team and offers transition assessment, educational occupational therapy assessment and consultation, as well as remote community and home-based individual coaching aimed at supporting functional skill development. Um, Dr. Wood uses occupation-based occupation -based interventions and strategies to develop life skills, executive functioning, emotion regulation, and other key transition-related skills. Um, so I, I really enjoy working with her, and I'm excited that we get to co-present. Yeah, thank you for that great introduction, <laughs> Kelly. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> and then just to give you a little background on NESCA, in case you um, aren't familiar with our practice, NESCA stands for Neuropsychology and Education Services for Children and Adolescents, um, although we serve a good number of young adults <laughs> as well. So we really serve um, children uh, ages 20 months all the way up to about age 30, although we have the occasional 33 or 34 year old that we're willing to work with if it's clinically appropriate. Um, we're a group practice with offices in Newton and Plainville, Massachusetts, as well as Londonderry, New Hampshire. And we specialize in assessment, treatment, and consultation services for children, adolescents, and young adults with special needs, whether mild or complex. Our clinical staff is awesome. Um, it's comprised of 14 expert neuropsychologists and five transition specialists who have um, a mix of backgrounds in school and guidance counseling, occupational therapy, and both rehab counseling. We also have special educators and consultants on staff, um, psychoeducational counselors, 
who will do more sort of goal-directed um, short-term therapy work with students, treatment providers, including occupational therapists and speech language pathologists. Um, and, uh, you know, pers- we have personal trainers on staff, um, <laughs> yoga therapist on staff. So we have a really sort of well-rounded and eclectic team for supporting students. Um, NESCA was founded in 2007 as a neuropsychology practice, but we've had transition specialists on staff and offered transition services since 2009, so essentially since the beginning of the practice. This means that thinking about transition planning is ingrained into our practice, and each of our clinicians aims to provide thorough and accurate testing that can support a family and team in creating a roadmap for helping a child progress toward adult life. So that is a lot of information about us. Um, if you uh, are able to, we would love to sort of ask you to type into the chat part of um Zoom, type into the chat, or if you're watching us on Facebook, feel free to type in there and just let us know whether you're an advocate or attorney or a parent or an educator or other professional and how old the students are that you tend to work with or support. Um, That just gives us information when we're doing examples or taking questions later so we kind of know who's in the audience. And while you guys are chatting, we'll sort of um, step forward and go through the agenda. So in terms of what we're hoping to to this morning. These are the questions that we are really hoping to answer. Um, So why talk about transition services for students with mental health issues? You know, it's a medical issue. Why talk about this? Um, How do we define transition services and assessment? How do we conduct transition assessment for a student who's too anxious or depressed to set goals? Uh, What treatment and skill development is critical for students with significant chronic mental health issues? And what other services and linkages are critical when transition planning? And then finally, just thinking about how do we balance mental health treatment needed to keep a student alive with planning for the future? Um, so as I said before, we, uh, we welcome questions, but we will take most of those toward the end. So first I wanna jump, we wanna jump into the why. Why is this so important to talk about? Well, we have some statistics here. So on average, 12.7% of all children and adolescents have a mental health diagnosis. So that's more than one in 10 um, children or adolescents with a diagnosis. And 50% of psychiatric conditions have an onset before age 14. So this is something we need to start thinking about and talking about early. 75% have an onset before age 25. And it's been found that students with emotional behavioral disorders have the highest rates of school incompletion. So they may have low school performance, low attendance, um, their grades are impacted, and retention. The rate is six times for these students, six times the risk of dropping out compared to those without a serious mental health condition. So this is really, really important to be thinking about when thinking about transition services. So jumping to pandemic related mental health challenges. Before the pandemic, mental health was getting worse and we were seeing that mental health was getting worse for high school students. Then the pandemic hits, right? And more than 37% of high school students reported experiencing poor mental health during COVID. 44%, as you can see here, felt persistently sad and hopeless. A study, um, a recent study showed that youth who felt connected to peers and adults were significantly less likely to report feelings of um, sadness and hopelessness we're less likely to consider attempting suicide and attempt suicide. So that connection, that connection to adults and peers is so, so, so important for mental health. And that's part of the reason why our students were experiencing this this real decline. Um, They just were feeling less connection than they had before. Um, In addition, you know, some students' schools are safe places going to school is where they feel comfortable. Um, So they were having some more, there's more emotional abuse that could have happened, physical abuse, economic instability. Parents, a lot of people losing their jobs. That was a big problem. So then there's just economic instability within the home. 
just a lack of overall treatment when you're when you're home and you can't go places in person it can be a lot harder to get the treatment that you need so we've just seen such an uptick related to the pandemic so this is really important now this is really important to talk about so throughout this presentation we are going to be using the term chronic mental health challenges um, so what that encompasses is major depression, generalized anxiety, bipolar disorder, um, also pieces of, of schizophrenia, um, but we wanted to use this general term. So yes, for each individual diagnosis, there's gonna be specific things that you should do and you can do to help um, students, children with, with those diagnoses. But for the purposes of this presentation, we are going to focus primarily on um, general interventions, general strategies for those with mental health challenges. All right, so now that we've sort of defined chronic mental health challenges, I wanna review the basics of transition planning and services, right? We have two concepts here sort of who are the students we're talking about and what are the services we're talking about? We wanna make sure we're all on the same page for that. So um, if you're a parent or a professional um, of a child who participates in special education, you might be familiar with the Individuals, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act um, or IDEA 2004. And this is the law that guarantees the right to free and appropriate public education for students with disabilities. And certainly, you know, students with chronic, you know, severe chronic mental health issues are often students who have disabilities that are impacting their access to education and to the life of the school, right? So um, IDEA applies to these students. Um, transition services themselves are federally mandated and are defined in IDEA 2004. Within the definition of IEP, the law states that no later than age 16, and it's actually 14 in Massachusetts or New Hampshire, if you happen to be watching from there, um, a student's IEP must include appropriate measurable post-secondary goals based upon age-appropriate transition assessments related to training, education, employment, and where appropriate independent living skills. And certainly ADLs end up being um, pretty critical for a lot of our students with mental health issues. Um, so we need to see post high school goals that are based upon assessments. And then the IEP also needs to include the transition services, including courses of study that are gonna be needed to assist the child in reaching those goals. So this is, you know, comes right out of the federal law, what needs to be included in the IEP for students. In terms of how the transition services are defined, they're a coordinated set of activities that's designed to be within a results-oriented process that's focused on improving the academic and functional achievement of the child with a disability to facilitate the child's movement from school to post-school activities, including post-secondary education, vocational education, integrated employment, including supported employment, continuing in adult education, adult services, independent living, or community participation. Um, and transition services is based on the child's needs, but also takes into account the child's strengths, preferences, and interests. And so that makes transition services different from a lot of other things that we talk about when we're um, participating in a special education process, because the services need to be designed taking into account the strengths, preferences, and interests. And transition services include instruction, related services, community experiences, the development of employment and other post-school adult living objectives, and if appropriate, acquisition of daily life living skills and functional vocational evaluation. So there are a whole range of um, instruction and services and activities that can be part of transition services for a student. This is a simplified chart, um, although it is really hard to simplify this concept um, of just, you know, what transition services are supposed to incorporate, right? So it's based on the strengths, preferences, and interests and needs of the student. 
there's an expectation that the student will participate, that there will be transition assessment in Massachusetts, that a transition planning form will be used, and that every IEP is going to have measurable post high school goals in it. There are four goal areas that we're looking at in terms of outcomes for students. So planning for post-secondary education, employment, independent living, and community involvement. And there are four concepts that are really important when we think about transition planning and services. We're vision-driven, right? We're, we're sort of planning based on hopes and visions for the future. We're results-oriented. Uh, we're focused on, again, results at the end of this process. The services are coordinated. It's not you know, about parent providers and school clinicians providing services in buckets, you know, uh, we're really working in a coordinated way to support a student in progressing forward. And we need to be focused on academic and functional, not just, you know, is the student passing classes, um, but also what's going on functionally. Um, and if we think about things like determining strengths and preferences and interests and student participation and valid assessment and naming post-secondary goals, a lot of these activities or characteristics of transition services become quite complicated when a student's struggling with a severe pervasive mental health condition. Um, but we do have to keep focus on transition planning and services for the students. There can be a tendency to focus on treatment and survival, which is completely necessary, but we can't focus so much on the present that we completely exclude discussion about planning for post-secondary adult life. As previously described, you know, every IEP for a student 14 and older in Massachusetts and New Hampshire or 16 and older nationally, um, depending on the state you're in, um, needs to have measurable post-secondary goals, post-high school goals that are based on age-appropriate transition assessment. Um, a lot of times then we say, okay, what is age-appropriate transition assessment? And interestingly, there is no definition in the federal law, um, but there is sort of a federally recognized definition that comes from the Division on Career Development and Transition of the Council for Exceptional Sil Children. And that defines transition assessment as an ongoing process of collecting data on the individual's needs, preferences, and interests as they relate to the demands of current and future working, educational, living, and personal and social environments. So it might be counterintuitive to initiate transition assessment for a student who's either stuck ruminating about the past or catastrophizing about the future, but it can actually be a positive experience for the student and it's a really important and useful and legally mandated step for getting the information needed for transition planning, right? Um, I know that I am seeing personally, um, or NESCO, we're sort of seeing a lot of consultation and assessment cases right now uh, where students perhaps did not have IEPs um, prior to the pandemic or prior to coming into sort of prior to sort of recent times. Um, but then maybe we're out of school for a prolonged period of time uh, for hospi hospitalization or residential treatment. Um, and so sometimes these students are actually going through eligibility process for special education for the first time, or maybe they're going through a re-eligibility process. And so, you know, the school district um, sort of team has put into place a number of assessments. But when I look at the assessment battery that was put together for the student, there's nothing that specifically applies to the student's strengths and preferences and interests for transition planning, um, and often not a lot that's related to future employment. And that shouldn't be the case. If we're sort of going through an eligibility process for anybody who's within the ages where the IEP needs to be, needs to include transition related information, needs to include transition services, and needs to include post-secondary goals based on age appropriate transition assessment, then that kind of assessment data needs to be part of the sort of eligibility or reevaluation process that this particular student's going through. Um, I certainly also have seen a lot of, um, you know, times when, when families and school districts might be working together in the student's best interest and be coming up with um, a legal settlement for a student just to get a student into a particular placement. Um, and might, that might be sort of seeming to be the best um, interest of the student, but um, oftentimes if something like that's happening without transition consultation or transition assessment data, 
um, that can be concerning because there may be needs that the student has related to making progress towards their post-secondary goals that haven't sort of come into the discussion that folks are having. So just really thinking about the fact that this is something that needs to be part of the process for every student who's, who's um, sort of transition in that 14 or heading into 14 up to 22 on an IEP. Um, just like any kind of testing a student has, there's lots of tools to choose from for transition assessment, right? And in fact, there's probably more potential tools for transition assessment than any other type of assessment a student would participate in during special education. Um, we sort of break these into formal assessments, which are typically standardized. With regard to administration and interpretation, um, these are norm referenced, which is helpful because they can give you information about how a student is functioning compared to students of a similar age or grade, or even sometimes the normed um, among students with particular type of disability. And then informal assessments are basically everything else, right? So, um, and there's a lot of great informal assessment that happens um, as part of transition assessment because um, we're really kind of looking at how students are individually functioning or what their individual interests and needs are. Um, as far as the balance between formal and informal testing, transition assessment has to have formal and informal measurements to meet the guidelines set forth in the law. Um, but typically one assessment from each column would technically meet the criteria. But again, we have to remember that we have to have information about the student's goals across all four of those areas we discussed. And we need to have information that can then inform transition services needed. And so, you know, if a student has an interest, um, I often say like attending college, because that is an interest for a lot of families that I work with, then we wanna make sure that there's been some data collected that's relevant for some of the skills that would be needed to matriculate into that environment, right? Um, has the student, is the student gonna meet diploma criteria or be able to get a GED or high set? Is the student gonna be able to meet the eligibility requirements for a school they might wanna attend? That you know, can be information that's very relevant. Um, a huge benefit of transition assessment is that there are a wide range of informal tools that you can choose from, as I mentioned. And I think informal tools are often a better way to engage the student um, because the administration can be adjusted to meet the student where they are at. They can feel more fun. They could feel more low pressure. <laughs> we don't have to use time testing for that. You know, I think time, time, like just starting a timer can be such an anxiety producing experience for students. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, I think sometimes being able to have a, a range of informal tools to choose from is, is really a good thing uh, for students who, when we want them to have a positive testing experience. A challenge with informal tests is that they're more open to interpretation. So it makes it critical that the evaluator be someone who's experienced in giving the tests and experienced in evaluating students with mental health issues, as well as any of the other diagnosis that the student may be contending with. Um, in addition to the testing battery being important, rapport with the student is really imperative. The evaluator needs to be someone who has a relationship with the student or who you know can formally for, can quickly sort of form rapport with the student. I think sometimes parents or school staff can gauge ahead of time whether an evaluator might be a good match for the student. Um, it can be tempting to try to set up an interview or a meeting ahead of, you know, an assessment process to try to reduce the pressure for the student, but that can go either way. For some students, you know, it gets the ball rolling. They have a relationship with the evaluator. They're more likely to come in for testing. For other students, <laughs> you know, it's like they had anxiety around that initial process. They met the person and then it like took so much to get through just that meet and greet that they now don't have it in them to show up for testing later. So, um, you know, personally, I tend to think it can be helpful to make sure you have a really skilled evaluator and a good sense that they're going to be able to work with the student and then just try to get testing done um, in, in one shot or, you know, especially a student who's been home for a while and we're trying to get them out of the house for this um, or we're having an evaluator come in, you know, sort of for like a one shot can be the best way to get as much data as possible. Um, I did have a colleague whose student eloped at the beginning of a testing session. <laughs> and uh, that this, we've had a lot of new things happen at NASCA in the last few years. But mm -hmm. um, so that particular student ended up doing better by warming up on Zoom for a few sessions before coming back into the office, right? I think, you know, it, there has to be sort of a willingness to be creative with the evaluation process. Um, 
And uh, so I think just, you know, being able to kind of meet the student wherever they're at and get the information that we need to be able to come up with post-secondary goals and, and transition services for that particular student. So I'm going to let Lindsay tell you a little bit more about assessment. Yeah, so in terms of challenges, I mean, Kelly outlined some good ones at the start, like showing up, right? You know, she was sharing the story about the, the student who who just left the testing um, session when they got there. So I'm going to talk about some challenges and things that we can consider and things we can do to help um, help those students succeed in the testing environment. So some of those challenges, right? Number one, showing up when you're anxious, when you're depressed, um, when you have other mental health challenges, it's going to be it's hard to get up in the morning. Maybe you're having a lot of anxiety about the test itself and what to expect. So just showing up can be really, really hard. And then sustaining that effort throughout the entire testing session. If you're there for four hours, it can be really hard to sustain your effort through that time period and be motivated to keep putting your best effort forward. Um, there can be distress and dysregulation. As Kelly mentioned, if something's timed, if we're doing a, a timed test, that can that can cause a lot of a lot of dysregulation. Um, I had a student see, I kind of I, I learned this maybe the hard way. I had a student and we did a time test and he just became com completely dysregulated, um, walked out of the room. It took some time to get him back and we realized, OK, time tests aren't something that are going to work for this student. And that also gives us information about how to adequately transition plan in the future too. So there's lots of information you can get from that, but ideally it's great to help a student stay regulated so they're not becoming distressed. Um, also naming goals. If someone is, again, has a chronic mental health um, challenge and is depressed, it can be hard to think about the future and hard to name their strengths. Some of my students just say, I don't have any strengths. I don't know. I can't think of anything. We get a lot of I don't knows um, unless you're able to work through that and you know other strategies, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then poor performance on standardized tests often occurs because of a lot of times because of that timing piece and then anxiety around, around testing. So what are some things that we can consider? First of all, it's really important to do a thorough record review so we can learn and get a, a full sense of the student. And we can also learn, okay, what testing has already been done recently so we don't have to repeat it. Because the last thing we want to do is to make the battery even longer than it needs to be, right, with students who are fatiguing quickly. So if something's done recently in their recent history and recent testing, uh, maybe it's something we don't have to repeat. We're going to do a full history. We want a holistic picture. Um, of our clients. We want to learn about their strengths and interests and preferences, but from the perspective of many different people and many different contexts, because we want to see maybe they're performing differently at home versus at school versus in the community and trying to figure out where that breakdown is. So by doing a thorough history um, and interviewing a lot of people in that student's life, we're going to get a big um, holistic view of that, of that student. And previewing. Again, sometimes it's really helpful to provide a lot of information for students. Other students do better when they just show up. Um, but for most of my students that I've worked with, previewing is really effective. So this means I'm giving a lot of information to the parents. I'm telling them what to expect. You know, what's the environment going to look like? Um, what time does testing start? When are we going to do lunch? And then giving opportunities for choice, like figuring out, okay, is there a typical time that your student likes to eat lunch and I can ask them directly you know when they get there and testing what time would you like to have lunch and how long would you like and giving them kind of options to have some autonomy and feel like they have a little bit of control can be really can be really helpful setting up the testing environment is important too if we're working with someone who has different um, sensory preferences difficulty with sensory regulation we need to know that ahead of time. Again, that's why our record review and our thorough history is also going to be important in interviews with family. Maybe they're really sensitive to sound or touch. Or right now, most of our testing setup is this two office space we established because of COVID. So we have 
people in two different rooms, you know, we're in one room, students in the other, and then we have glass um, in between, and that means we're using headphones to talk. Some students, though, just can't tolerate the feeling of those headphones, so there's always the option, um, are we going to use the, the speakerphone intercom, or maybe when they're doing that, once they've gotten the directions for the assessment, they can take those headphones off and give themselves a break. So those are things that we're thinking about. Also during the interview, we interview students at the beginning and it can be really hard to talk about yourself and just sit there and answer these personal questions. So I like to ask families, does your student like to use fidgets? Would they wanna draw during that time? I had a student bringing crochet and she crocheted while we talked and it was easier for her to open up um, because of that. And then easy tests. So it can be hard to have a lot of open response. So if we minimize those and use checklists or simple Likert scales, that can be helpful sometimes. And I've alluded to this already, but it's important to triangulate that data. So we're getting info from parents, teachers, providers, bringing that all together. Um, <clears throat> We likely will do more than one interest inventory to make sure the data is reliable. So we'll give them one interest inventory related to their work preferences. And then maybe during the second half of testing, we'll give them another one to make sure that they match up and the answers are reliable and they repeat. Repeating questions in different ways is helpful. So that strengths, I said it's really hard for kids to act, to answer what are your strengths? So certain things we can do is break that down a little bit and ask about the, their strengths in different areas of life. We can also ask it in a different way. So what would other people say are your best qualities? And I've actually found that a lot of students answer that question a lot easier when they're not thinking about what do I think I'm good at, but what does my mom think I'm good at? What does my teacher think I'm good at? It's a lot easier for them to answer it. In terms of the content, we wanna be able to figure out what education they still need, what training they still need, what employment could look like and how are they gonna get there, um, as well as skills needed for building those independent living skills or transition. Um, it's also really helpful to do observations. So if we can actually see them engaged in their activities in their school, in their community, that can be a really helpful way um, to assess. So what makes a difference in post-secondary life for young adults with disabilities? So this, this study here that's listed, um, it identified six different areas that are, are really important for success when leaving high school um, and entering that new world as a young adult, right? So self-awareness is one, goal setting, being able to identify what you need to do and how you're gonna get there, perseverance, you know, working through something that's hard. You just keep trying. If it if it doesn't work the first time, being able to try something new and, and keeping at it without being discouraged. Um, using the available resources. A lot of people don't know what's available to them. So learning that skill and learning how to find it is, is extremely important. Developing those emotional coping strategies People are not always going to be regulated. Things are not going to always be going well. So we need to figure out how to cope when things aren't going well. And then self-determination, feeling like you have control over your own life and you can goal set and you can make your own decisions. So those are things that are really important for young adults with disabilities across the board, not just with mental health challenges. Specifically, for those with chronic mental health challenges. These are some areas that we are gonna go into more in depth um, and the importance of them. So I'll just go over them first. So coping strategies is really important. Making sure you have the psychopharmacological intervention you need, you know, the medication that you need. Making sure you have health habits, good relationships, meaningful employment, that you've built up your life skills, that you're reducing technology and social media, that you have efficacy experiences, and that there's interagency collaboration. So we're gonna go into each of these. So coping strategies, you know, like your medication's important, 
right? And treatment's important, but it's not the whole plan. So skill-based therapy is really great. So I'm talking cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, um, exposure and response prevention therapy, acceptance acceptance and commitment therapy. I'm not going to go into all of these, but those skill-based therapies can be really effective. Students need to be able to recognize their emotional triggers. So what is it in the environment that triggers you? If you're going into a setting, a new setting, it's important to be able to know ahead of time, is there something in this environment that may be triggering for me? Um, also, you need to be able to recognize your emotional state. How are you feeling? Is something building up? If something's building up, is it time to use a coping strategy? So being able to independently select that coping strategy in a variety of settings is a really, really important thing to be teaching. So just examples of strategies, you know, being able to ask for help, using a calming technique, processing with a counselor, taking a break. Um, recently, I was working with a client who, who has pretty severe anxiety. Um, and they have a job interview actually happening tomorrow. So we were talking through how can we help you go into this job interview and how can we help you stay regulated? Because we know interviews are something that are, are really difficult, cause a lot of, are very triggering, cause a lot of emotional response. So when we were talking about it, they were saying, I wish I could bring my cat, but their cat's um, not a, a therapy cat and it's, they can't bring their cat with them. It does not like car rides. So that wasn't an option. So we were trying to figure out, okay, for you, animals are really regulating. That's a great coping strategy. So when discussing it, we're like, okay, why don't you bring your weighted stuffed animal in the car? That's something you can keep on, keep with you on your way to the interview. Um, you can also watch some videos of animals before you go into the interview. So using those two strategies, they're hoping it's happening tomorrow. So I don't know if it's successful yet, but they're hoping that they will be able to stay regulated and stay calm leading up to that interview. So it's figuring out how can we help support coping strategies and how can st students learn to figure it out on their own um, and generalize these outside of their counseling sessions. So going to the psychopharmacological intervention, when thinking about transition, we need to be thinking about, okay, do they have a prescriber for after high school? If they're going away to college, is there someone there who's gonna be prescribing them medication? If they're moving away from home again, is there gonna be someone there to prescribe them medication? <clears throat> they also need to have those medication management skills if they're gonna be away from home and have the goal of living away from home. Can you set an appointment and go to your medical appointments? Are you familiar with health insurance? Um, can you bring in your prescriptions to the pharmacy, pick up your prescriptions, pay for them? And just those executive function skills, if you're running low on your medication, you need to be able to notice that and you need to be able to call for a refill. Then we have to think, okay, maybe, maybe your executive function skills, maybe you need some accommodations, but that's something we need to figure out ahead of time. Um, so figuring out if you need your medications delivered at a set time automatically every month in a pack so it's already distributed. But again, this is all part of that planning process and figuring out how, how is this student going to be successful once they're on their own. So again, treatment's important, but not the whole plan. Health habits. This is probably not surprising, but research has shown that if you have basic health routines, this is very impactful for successful transition out of high school and into college or employment or adult activities, especially for those with mental health challenges. So this means setting up a basic self-care routine. Does the student have routines? Do they have a morning routine? Do they have an evening routine that they're following? Um, are they getting enough sleep? You know, it's important to get those seven to nine hours. I've seen more and more frequently those students who are using phones to regulate at night. Um, they're just on their phone. They're starting to 
ruminate or think about what's happening the next day. So then they start the scrolling, right? So they're scrolling and scrolling for hours on their phone because they don't want to put it down and then all the thoughts come into their head. So helping them develop those healthy sleep habits and figuring out alternate coping strategies so they are able to get enough sleep. Eating a balanced diet, regular exercise, avoiding drugs and alcohol, um, and then doing some body-based stress reduction. What can we do to actually activate that parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of your body, the, the rest and digest? How can we activate that to calm the body, which helps calm the mind? So deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, yoga, mindfulness, meditation. Maybe you have a nice shower where you spray some essential oils, make it a real calming, lovely experience. What can you, what can your student learn to do to help reduce the stress in their body? There's still life skill. A lot of times students still have to build some life skills when they're transitioning out of high school. Like we may see, oh, they don't know how to buy their own clothing. They don't know what size they are or what toiletries to buy for themselves, how to get over the counter medications. What do I need to take when I have a cold? Um, basic budgeting skills, arranging transportation, you know, in an emergency, using public transportation. Um, all of these, are so important if you're going off and being on your own, we need to make sure our students can do this and aren't, you know, say, using shopping as a coping skill and blowing their whole budget, right? How can we teach something different and how can we help them manage that budget? Um, relationships and relational methodologies are also critical for these students. So, in terms of what we know from research, social skills intervention can be especially important in order to make sure that the student has the skills to understand, build, navigate, and maintain healthy relationships. And you can imagine that the type of social skills intervention, or even necessarily like who's providing the service delivery might look different for a student whose primary challenges are related to chronic mental health issues as opposed to, a, you know, say an autism spectrum disorder, right? So it's important that students have social skills intervention that is appropriate for who that student is, how that student learns and sort of where their social skills challenges lie. Um, certainly um, parents and uh, parental involvement are an important piece of this puzzle. And um, this isn't specifically on this slide, but I think especially for students who have spent um, significant periods of time out of the home or hospitalized or in residential kinds of programming um, or even just, um, you know, sort of families trying to navigate sort of a mental health diagnosis that maybe came up in adolescence or other things, sort of family therapy, family treatment, you know, sort of. Um, parents having support that they need um, to both be able to neg negotiate a relationship with the student as the student's becoming more of an adult and to be able to allow the student to take risks, which needs to be part of transition planning, but it is also incredibly scary for a student who's, who's um, dealing with you know, severe chronic mental health challenges um, can be really important. So there's, there's a parent and parent relationship piece of this that's important. And then relationships with other adults, especially adults at school, are remarkably important as are relationships with peers at school and ultimately, you know, sort of how that individual forges or carries um, relationships into post high school community settings. So when supporting students with chronic mental health issues, um, I work with a lot of students, right? They've, they've had a lot of treatment or their whole life has been about treatment for a significant period of time. And so we may be working with a student who's had negative experiences with therapy or a negative experience with a social skills group. Um, and so they like they're done. They don't want <laughs> they don't want the sort of same interventions that they've had before. And so you might be creative in terms of how you introduce another adult or another supportive relationship into the student's life. Right. So the student's very motivated or even just slightly motivated to attend college. You might introduce somebody who's a college coach or a college counselor and the relationship might start, you know, with that sort of being the focus of the relationship because that's something that the student's motivated for and 
an appointment that they might show up for, right? If they think they might be interested in a job, we could introduce a career coach or career counselor, um, or a youth might be really open to the idea of mentoring. Um, and mentoring is sometimes like the only service the kid's up for, you know, it being introduced to a low pressure social and leisure opportunity. You know, we're just going to go, I don't know, go get pancakes at IHOP once a week because that's <laughs> what's exciting for that student. We certainly have to work on like the diet and healthy stuff too, but whatever's going to sort of get the student to have more relationships and uh, be out and about can be important. Um, I know I've been working with a student for eight years um, uh, and, um, you know, it's some, like the only adults um, that student kept in their life um, was myself and a mentor, even though there have been a number of therapists and prescribers and other people who um, have been involved. But sometimes it's sort of the relationships that aren't about your medical treatment um, that may be the relationships that persist the most for some students. Um, in terms of the school-based team, Figuring out who at school is invested or can invest in the student is critical. Um, it's even more important if a student is struggling with school refusal because it's the relationships the student has or wants to have that might spark motivation uh, for building skills and making changes, right? So um, having a connection to a human that's in the school, having something to look forward to can be really critical for students. Um, with regard to peers, um, I think, you know, it's funny, I, I may have students who are going to private therapeutic school and they're skipping all the classes, but they're like going to school every day because they really enjoy interacting with the peers, right? So these relationships can be kind of critical. We certainly want more for those students, but the relationships can be very pivotal uh, in terms of transition planning and in terms of students, you know, being able to take on uh, new activities, right? Um, so certainly social skills and socialization and relationships have to be a part of the transition plan. You know, we have to know how these are going to be part of this student's special education process um, and how that student's going to continue to access social activities and relationships after high school. Paid meaningful employment is a predictor of success with transition, especially for youth with mental health issues. But there are also studies indicating that managing school and work can in increase stress or decrease sleep or exacerbate mental health, mental health issues for some students. So we have to be sort of thoughtful. So it, this needs to be considered for every student and we have to be thoughtful about whether it's the right sort of piece of the student's transition plan. Um, there's certainly an opportunity for youth to build skills, efficacy, and enhance mood if um, employment is managed well. And um, I can't say enough about like this right now, this sort of moment in time economically. It's such a great moment in time for students to be starting work experiences because it is really easy to get hired right now and very difficult to get fired right now. And so it gives you know more, more young people and sort of first time workers an opportunity to have an efficacy experience with employment. Um, I know sometimes volunteer work is the best case scenario for starting out. A student, you know, might do better with a job if it's not paid, if it's low pressure, you know, if it doesn't have a regular schedule and it's a drop in, you know, just sign up by shift or show up when you can. Um, there are some of those opportunities out there and sometimes that's a, a way for a student to get started with employment. Um, some students may need to go with a peer or an adult that they trust in order to stay better regulated during an employment experience. You know, it could be that the whole family's volunteering um, or a class or a mentor relationship. Um, you can certainly start with single volunteer experiences like, you know, food pantry or cradles to crayon, like just get out and doing something one time um, for a student to kind of see how that goes. It's important to get started in whatever way is most feasible for the individual, but it's important to also not to leave employment out of the conversation. And then certainly for a lot of students, we need to be thoughtful in our transition planning because many students are going to ex should expect to need to take mental health days off from work as adults if this has been sort of a significant piece of something that they've needed you know, as a teenager, as a young adult. And so it can be really helpful to be factoring that in when we think about the employment options that are going to be the best fit for the young person. Um, there's also been a lot of research and interest on technology overuse and addiction, as well as the connections between social media and bullying and mental health in recent years. Um, and certainly what we know from research is that if we can, you know, reduce tech and social media use, 
that has you know a more positive impact on students being successful with transition. So um, I know uh, Elizabeth Englander from Bridgewater State University um, founded the Mass Aggression Reduction Center and they've done quite a bit of research and presenting on the topic of managing children's and teens screen time and technology use. So if you ever have the opportunity to see her present, um, she provides a lot of strategies. But when we look at this, you know, it's like the bottom line is that the best intervention for reducing screen time and managing technology is increasing non-screen time <laughs> into the student's life, right? So if there are any interests that we can be supporting that don't just involve a screen, then um, the more we can sort of support those kinds of activities, the more we can get students outdoors, um, you know, sort of the more time a student can, can spend away from a device um, doing other things that are productive or make them happy, um, the better off we are, right? So increasing real life social experiences, um, you know, increasing attentional self-awareness, et cetera. So, and there are certainly steps that we can take to help youth manage technology and social media use, um, which are similar to steps we would take anytime we're trying to change a behavior. Um, so we could help, you know, students to be more mindful and aware of their technology use by taking pauses, seeing what that feels like, you know, taking data on their usage. You take data on any behavior and it's going to have an impact on that behavior. And I think students are often really surprised. And some, you know, it's like my phone tells me how much, how much I've been using which apps per week, right? But is a student talking about that with any adult? Um, and then even using apps, there's some cool apps like Forest, which reinforces actively not using your technology. So that's an app that literally it <laughs> creates a picture and like grows trees for every minute or every second that you're not touching your phone. And so what it does is it creates a pause when you go to pick up your phone, right? Because we just, we do this without even thinking. You pick up your phone, you scroll to Facebook or whatever, or students, Instagram, you know, Snapchat, whatever. And if there, you've got the forest app on there, you pick it up and you see you've grown seven trees and you're like, oh, I don't want to kill my forest. And so you set your phone down and you keep engaging in some of these more real world social experiences. Um, there are times though, that it's going to be important to set limits on technology and um, not just have devices and internet accessible 24 hours a day. And sometimes students do need help with that. But then certainly the students need to learn to self-monitor and self-manage or they won't successfully make the transition from high school. Um, something else that I want to mention, I've sort of alluded to this, is the need for students who are struggling with severe mental health challenges to experience success and efficacy and to break a pattern of failing at everything or feeling like they are failing at everything. So while some students require intensive treatment at a residential or partial inpatient level, you know, the education and transition plan can't just be treatment. So our plan can't just be a hospital or a hospital-based program. Uh, we still need to be thinking about um, other pieces of the student's profile in life. So if the only structured thing a student's doing every day is therapy, that may not be good for their mental health. Um, I'm not saying the therapy isn't, but if that's the only thing that's sort of a piece of their identity at that point in time, it's, it's not necessarily preparing the student for other things um, other than regulating. It may not even be preparing the student to regulate while doing other activities. So um, I know that a lot of students that I've worked with um, who've spent multiple months or multiple years in hospitals, um, some of those students have made the most progress when they've significantly reduced the time in their day that they spent talking about their mental health, right? As we increased it, as we increased other pieces of their identity. And that doesn't mean, you know, again, doesn't mean the treatment isn't important. It's just thinking more holistically. Um, some experiences that have been large game changers for students have included, you know, taking a GED and passing that if MCAS and the high school requirements just weren't like they didn't fit that kid anymore, you know, um, auditing or taking an online or in-person college course, right? Like trying something different, um, sometimes that's maybe more age appropriate, can be helpful, you know, starting a volunteer position, starting a paid job, um, even just like going into a grocery store and getting a couple of items off of a list, you know, sometimes with like some instruction or some support, but then being able to do those things on their own, right? Starting to build 
independence and success in areas where there hasn't been independence and success um, in a while can be really important. Um, I have seen also, you know, getting a pet, taking care of the pet successfully can be really meaningful for a student who's anxious, depressed, or has a trauma history. Um, we got to think about what <laughs> what might be a good pet in those circumstances. You know, it's like dogs are a lot more work than cats or fish. Um, so, you know, again, we want to kind of be setting the bar um, where it's attainable and where it will, you know, be um, increased level of challenge for the student, but not too challenging, right? So fish or cat might be an easier starting place for some of those things. Um, and then these are some of the organizations when we think about interagency collaboration for transition planning. Um, these are some of the organizations that it can help to be familiar with. So Department of Mental Health, you know, we think about because the student's got a mental health issue. Um, something to understand is that they can be very supportive when they're involved. They have some great resources for transition age youth, but entry into Department of Mental Health can be complicated. A lot of times a student is only eligible for services after they've experienced a significant crisis or like during a significant crisis. And so um, sometimes, you know, that's the point at which uh, we look to kind of get services in place. Um, Mass Rehab Commission has both pre-employment transition services, which are carried out by a number of local agencies and can be supportive for students in terms of career counseling, job exploration, work-based learning experiences, um, counseling on post-secondary education and training. I've also found that um, the M Mass Rehab and pre-employment staff can be helpful in articulating, um, you know, helping the team to think about how close the student is to being able to use adult MRC services or how close the student is to being able to be employable. Um, and then the state does have, um, so voc rehab services are the services the student would have after high school. Uh, they might get involved in like a, the last year that a student's in high school helping to plan for after high school. Um, and those are sort of services to help young people get a job um, and supports that they might need on the way there. Um, and then the state does also have independent living centers that can be accessed by any individual with a disability. Those can help with advocacy, information and referral, peer support, or skills training. Um, some of these ILCs also have coordinators who work directly with transition age youth on goals of their choosing. I didn't put the Department of Developmental Services on here, um, DDS, but certainly if a student has an autism diagnosis, um, the family might need to seek support from DDS rather than DMH initially. So right, seeking support around autism services um, and then mental health might be the secondary. Uh, there are some times when DDS and DMH partner together, uh, but the point is there should be, you know, often should be some agencies involved as we're getting close to exiting high school, if not beforehand. Um, this is just an example, um, sort of a, a case study to share. Um, sort of a, a, this is a student who's 18 and um, still has support from their high school district, but was after 12th grade. Student has a lot of um, anxiety, social anxiety, major depression, um, body image um, challenges, and passive suicidal ideation, right? Um, student had um, attended school out of the country and then came back and finished school here during remote learning and was um, sitting and doing no programming. And they had a, a really phenomenal neuropsychological evaluation done and those recommendations focused on psychiatry and medical, you know, getting a medical workup, making sure there was good um, group-based therapy in place and skill-based individual therapy and residential therapeutic programming. And then they suggested meeting with a transition specialist. Um, and when I met with the student, we really focused on like, this is a student who's bright, loves basketball, loves video games, you know, math and physics and restaurants. Um, but right now rarely leaves the house, wasn't really interested in going anywhere residentially, um, didn't have many chores, um, struggled with, um, you know, some basic kinds of pet care at the house, no driver's license, right? So a lot of things missing in terms of the life skills. And so what we came up with for transition planning were things like, you know, okay, we're gonna explore certain local day programs, but let's also set some short-term goals, you know, um, working towards a learner's permit, um, opening a bank account, because the student didn't have one. And that's actually something that we see through research is that adults with disabilities are just less likely to have bank accounts than other adults. Um, and like, again, it's like these small things can be 
confidence building over time, right? Or just, <laughs> um, but also working on shopping for some personal items. Um, I'm big on being able to shop for, you know, food that you're going to eat, clothes that you're going to wear, toiletries that you're going to use, <laughs> you know, like those kinds of like learning to shop for those kinds of things. Um, also ordering meals online or by phone, right? It's sort of like something that could be done with a script, but would be a step towards more independence. And um, doing some service work with a, doing community service with a parent, and then also considering volunteering with the town basketball league. So there were a lot of things that we could put in place. Um, certainly, it's not all going to be tackled at once, um, but it's um, we're you know a different way of thinking about sort of how to build programming for a student. And I do want to just also highlight some other organizations that can be very helpful to be familiar with in terms of supporting students. Um, certainly, NAMI. Um, PayPal can be invaluable, especially as a parent resource. Um, JRI has good uh, services. I, oh, I shouldn't say good services, but has um, been a good support. To, <laughs> it's hard to say. There, we have so many great service providers in Massachusetts, but these are just good resources to be aware of. Um, UMass has transitioned to Adulthood Center for Research, and they're doing presentations all the time, and they're doing activities really around empowering young people. Um, to sort of with transition planning to be more successful college students or to be more successful workers. Um, it's a lot of great information. Um, Judge Baker also offers some provider directory matching. And then these are some important um, hotlines and helplines that can be really um, critical for families at times. And then just a few additional resources. Um, and I do believe that um, we will be able to email out slides to folks um, if you were registered for the webinar. So uh, you'll be able to click through some of these links when you get the copy of those, um, but there's just uh, some different um, information here as far as where to find more webinars or more information on the topic. Um, we have just a few minutes left. Um, if there happen to be any audience questions, um, so I wanted to kind of open up the floor for those. And we may we may have covered things so thoroughly that there aren't questions. Kelly, if you could just repeat the name of the um, the resource that you provided from Bridgewater State, who had done some of that research for folks. Sure, um, it's Elizabeth Englander, E N G L A N D, and it's a. Um, I'm trying to think of it. Uh, it was like a. It's a bullying resource. <laughs> Let me, I'm going to flip back to the slide where I have it in my notes just to um, go back to the text slide here. Go back. Here we go. Um, it's the Massachusetts Aggression Reduction Center. Um, but if you just look up Elizabeth Englander and, and Bridgewater State, you know, it's like you'll start to get to some of the resources that she's put together. Um, and I have certainly, I have seen... Um, I, I, there's a lot of sort of activity um, in the Facebook space. Um, and then, you know, you will see presentations come up, especially in the Massachusetts area that um, she's giving. Um, and she does speak for local CPACs too. So if that's something that somebody's interested in, um, the community where I live, just our sort of uh, local parent group, not necessarily related to disabilities, just our local sort of moms group brought her in to present on technology. Um, and I think there's some good, there's some different like contracts for families to use, but also just um, good information about what kinds of strategies, you know, can be successful. And really thinking about the age at which um, students can be best able to use technologies, especially technologies that give them access to social media. Um, there's a lot of research on brain development for students that really indicates that students have an incredibly difficult time negotiating the social information that can be available um, on social media and even in some of our news before the age of about 13. And so I, I know um, one of the recommendations that um, 
I had seen come out of that center was oftentimes thinking about not doing a cell phone until that age, because if we really think about what cell phones are, they're just personal computers. <laughs> you know, it's very different than sort of the earlier, I think about like the Save by the Bell, Zach Morris cell phone that just, you know, just had buttons and dials. And I think, you know, handing a, a student technology is, is handing them access to a lot of information uh, without knowing if their brain's sort of able to make sense of that information. So there's some good information that has come out of um, that center and a uh, good opportunity to be able to, um, to learn more about that. Um, I know there were some other strategies that she had to, I mean, it's really important to keep students talking with you about technology and how they're using it and, you know, explain to me what apps you have on your phone and how you use those and students are asking to download new apps and they're at younger ages, you know, it's like, sure, just explain to me what, what having the app would do for you, how you'd use it, right? Like, <laughs> like really making sure that we're all sort of being, um, vetting some of those new technology information easily. I mean, there's no way for us as adults to stay on top of all the different types of technologies that, <laughs> right, that children and youth are able to access, but being able to have open conversations about it, uh, being able to help young people process information um, is just so important. Okay, and we have another question about um, someone who's interested in enrolling their child or having um, their young adult participate in some auditing of courses, and what is the best way to go about researching what might be appropriate and how to get involved in that? Yeah, so, um, I mean, that's tricky without a little more information, but I it's interesting because I have a student, I, I have a couple students this year who are auditing classes rather than taking them for credit because that's giving them enough information about sort of what it's like to be a college student, but with very low pressure. Um, you, you would need to be, you know, you'd need to be, have a particular college in mind and be in touch with that registrar to get a sense of whether they allow um, students to sort of like audit or a lot of it has to do with what classes are available to non-matriculated students, right? So like, what are the classes you could take either as a high school student or as a non-degree seeking student at that particular college or university? Usually those are gonna be the classes that would be um, available if a student's not enrolled full-time at that university, right? And then um, just talking with the registrar about the opportunity to be able to audit or take it not for credit, um, that's typically, not a difficult process as long as you're looking at the right courses. Um, and you would still be, you know, on the hook for tuition in the same way as somebody who might be taking the class for credit, typically. Um, some of this, I mean, some of the schools where I've seen students, you know, locally be able to take classes, certainly community colleges are almost always um, good options if you're going to be taking just one class or just a few classes. But most of our state colleges, um, I can't speak for all just because I haven't researched them all. It's probably all of them in Massachusetts, you know, where they, they may have some classes that you can take as a non-degree seeking student. Um, just again, for each university, sometimes the sort of what's in the course catalog, if you're not enrolled as a full-time student, may be different from what you could take as a full-time student. And so uh, figuring out what's gonna be motivating to the student and really figuring out the school that's gonna have that class available can be um, the sort of tricky piece of this, but you can get you know directly in touch with admissions and the registrar and, and learn those things. Um, and then you also have to be following the timelines that the college sets forth, right? So a lot of times registration for, the full-time students comes before registration for the non-matriculated students or the non-degree seeking students. And so you have like this short window of time where you can figure out, okay, there are spaces in these classes that I wanna take and I can get registered for that. Um, Cause it's usually a, a sort of shorter time period when you have the opportunity to sign up, if that makes sense. And then any um, tips or guidance you can offer in helping someone in their first year of college who's um, recently been diagnosed with ADHD and social anxiety? So I, I think, I mean, we work with a lot, of a lot of students, right? This is the time of year when we get those phone calls because we're right at sort of midterm time for college. And I think, um, I mean, interestingly, 
One thing that I would offer, not that this is how to help, but just how to normalize this experience. Um, I just published a blog. Nesca has a, a great blog that all of our clinicians contribute to. And I just published a, a blog this week talking about college statistics and the fact that it's you know less than half of college students who enroll for the first time at a four-year university will actually graduate from that four-year university in four years, right? It's closer to 30%. Um, and then, you know, even if we look at, okay, let's jump that to six years, it's still only about 60%. So I think one thing we need to understand is that a lot of students either pick the wrong college or have a tough time at college, you know, decide they're going to drop out or decide they're going to transfer after a first semester of college. So one thing is like struggling is normal. But then if you think about things like anxiety or attention or the executive functioning challenges the students having, you know, the issue is like, are there things that can be done to salvage the semester? <laughs> you know, I think, um, is the student going to professor office hours? Is the student, you know, using tutoring or executive function coaching going, you know, is this a student who's even registered with disability support services um, to get accommodations? If it's a student who's struggling with like new challenges and doesn't have documentation of that, they might need to have an evaluation to be able to qualify for accommodations at their college. Um, we do a lot of, we have uh, coaching services, both remote and in-person coaching services that NASCA um, focused on a lot of times the executive function and sort of not academic tutoring, but how to plan and organize and how to use the resources on the college campus. And some students just need a person, you know, um, that is meeting with them reliably that they have a relationship with before they can sort of launch into using all the different people in a college setting that you have to use well to be a successful college student. And I think that's hard, you know, in high school, the services come to you. The school is, is required to find you and support you. In college, you have to be able to explain what you need, explain your diagnoses, you know, produce the, the documentation of those. You have to be able to make appointments. You have to, you know, often have to be able to get all of your information turned in and different online portals and things like that. It's, it's a lot. Um, so a lot of students do struggle with the transition. And I think sort of getting to the heart of why this particular student is struggling and then you know either pushing in supports, whether it's executive function supports or counseling supports or what kinds of supports are needed is important. For some students, they've dug themselves into such a large hole that they it, it sometimes ends up being that the best thing to do is withdraw for mental health reasons um, and, and sort of like get all the, the supports in place that are needed and go back in a later semester. It just depends if a student's really at risk of like failing all of their classes um, that you might consider that that as an option. And seeing as I, I don't know this particular student, I'm not recommending that. <laughs> it's just to know that um, sometimes that's exactly what a student needs to do is sort of withdraw, figure out what went wrong, get all the supports in place and, and go back, you know, and they may have picked the wrong college, which a lot of students do. It's a very normal thing that a lot of us sort of make mistakes with in the United States in particular. Hmm. And uh, one more question here. I'm working with a teen who really feels he's very independent and I'm trying to figure out ways to show him that he needs to increase his independent skills without crushing his um, confidence or self-esteem. Lindsay, I don't know if you wanna <laughs> like take this one in terms of thinking about a student that you might coach who like doesn't know they have as many <laughs> challenges with independent skills. Yeah, I think, I mean, you don't want to crush their self-esteem. It's also important to help them figure out what's going on. So I think sometimes you can pair it with, with strengths. If you're having a conversation, you can, you can have start by having a conversation about what they're good at and pointing out what you think they're good at. Um, and then talking about how everyone has challenges. Maybe you want to share something that you have difficulty with just to normalize the fact that other people everyone has something that's difficult for them. So maybe you could share, you know, this is something that I have difficulty with. Mm. And then you can say, oh, I noticed. And you can point out what, what you noticed about them and say, have you, is there anything else that you've noticed? And um, see if once you share about yourself and once you share maybe something you've noticed about them, is there something that maybe they can think about? Uh, sometimes it's helpful to take it outside of them and do some, perspective taking and scenarios um, just present like putting them in like someone else's 
shoes, like what would you think about like if you had a friend who did this and then this and and see if they if they can think about it more in that way when it's not them, it's someone else um, and putting themselves in someone else's shoes and witnessing the same things that you might be witnessing in them. Um, it's tricky though, but I think I think normalizing the fact that everyone has areas that need to be worked on and it's a part of growing and maturing, you know, as you grow and mature, you have to continue to work on yourself across the board. Everyone has to do it. So these are goals that I'm working on. Let's think about the ones that you need to work on so that you can be independent because in order to reach these goals, that's the other thing. Think about what are their long-term goals um, and say, okay, you want to be a content creator on YouTube. I get that a lot. A lot of people want to be content creators on YouTube. And you can really break it down like, okay, what are some of those basic skills you're going to need to be a successful content creator? Because people who are successful content creators have to do X, Y, and Z. Um, looks like maybe you need to build that skill a little bit so that you can be successful in this area. So use their goals for the future um, to help figure out what they need to work on. Those would be some of my suggestions. I also think, um, you know, we, I'm going to just stop sharing so you can see our faces, but um, we, um, I uh, definitely think sometimes giving a student a life skills checklist, like there's, you know, the life skills inventory from Washington state. If you literally Google life skills inventory, Washington state, you'll find a copy of it. Although uh, you won't find it through Washington state, you'll find it through like a middle school in a different state, but there are all these like free checklists, Casey life skills, you know, that you can download online. And a lot of times with students, if I have them complete checklists about their skill levels, you know, maybe they're giving themselves all fours and fives, right? All high scores. But then I'm going to dig into the, the ones that are fours and try to figure out like, oh, OK, so these are fours instead of fives. Like, you know, like that to me is acknowledgement that that skill isn't perfect, even if it's really hard for the student to acknowledge that they have areas of challenge. And so sometimes you get the sense of the skills the student is more able to acknowledge that they're having a, a challenge with, right? Um, and I think that can be, you know, just invaluable. It, you know, even a student doesn't say like, oh, I'm bad at anything, but maybe they can say I'm less good at this. Or maybe they could take all the skills that they're good at and you could have them rank like, okay, you're great at everything on this, you know, on, on this sort of 20 skill checklist, which are you the best at, <laughs> right? Like let's rank order these things that you're all really good at. Because oftentimes students have some inkling that they're not quite as good at some things. It may not be the exact same things that, you know, um, parents or educators are noticing, um, but sometimes there's a way to find a few things that the student is willing to work on. And then once you get them, like just kind of reshaping the fact that like, yeah, there are things I can work on um, is, a, is a big sort of door opener in terms of this process. Right, I think those were all of the questions, unless anyone else has last minute thoughts or questions. All right, it doesn't look it. Well, we will um, be sending out this presentation to those of you who participated and um, feel free to always contact me or Kelly or Lindsay with um, questions that you may have stemming from this webinar. And thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and hope it helped. Thanks.